and uh, it'll be an opportunity for, well, certainly the panel, but hopefully for many of you to also just have an opportunity to express your appreciation to Gordon. Um, of course, this is a, a mixed celebration because as most of you are probably aware, uh, Maudine Fee passed away just not too long ago. So that uh, does affect uh, the tenor a bit here today. But uh, nonetheless, we are here to celebrate Gordon and to just let Gordon know how much he's loved and respected uh, by people in Society of Biblical Literature, Society of Pentecostal Studies, and other organizations. Um, my name is Glenn Charette. I teach New Testament at Northwest University in the Seattle area. And of course, Gordon's got very close connections with uh, the Pacific Northwest and Seattle in particular. The university where I teach, one of the halls is named after Gordon's father. And uh, it was an honor for us uh, four years ago to give a honorary doctorate to Gordon. So we have at Northwest, we have a particularly close affinity with Gordon. Um, Many family members, many, many of the family members are here. I'd like to uh, have Mark, uh, if you wouldn't mind just introducing those family members who are here today. Sure. Um, I'm Mark, I'm the oldest, and um, Cherith uh, just apologizes, regrets deeply that she couldn't be here. My mother actually passed away last Wednesday, mm -hmm. and so we were there kind of keeping vigil for almost 10 days. and. Uh, so she had already missed quite a bit of, um, for other things, had missed school, and so she really needed to stay home, but it's with deep regret that she's not here. Um, then my brother Craig <coughs> would have given anything to be here too. Um, he lives in New York and takes care of dad. My youngest brother Brian and his wife, Maria, why don't you guys stand so they can see you? <laughs> And then we also have my father's sister, Donna. Donna, go ahead, stand. And, uh, and two of her kids. <laughs> Leanne and David are two of her kids. Uh, the other two are not here. They've lived in San Diego. She's been here 55, 55 years. <laughs> no, I've lived since 19. Since 1955, so whatever the math is, I can <laughs> um, Math is definitely not my forte. Um, but I'm actually very, um, very excited to be here. I had dad for um, four classes when I was in at Gordon Conwell. I was there from 81 to 85. Um, he was my favorite professor. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that because he was my dad. <laughs> All of us wish we could have taken many more, because any of you have ever had him. He didn't just teach, he preached, and I was having fun with uh, Ricky Watts the other night that um, First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.5 says, and the gospel not only came with words, but with power and the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. And if you ever sat in dad's class, that's the way it was. And in fact, two different times, I came to him at the end and I said, Dad, you've got to stop ending class and saying, all right, you're dismissed. Yeah. I said, we don't want to be dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm dead serious. I mean, there were times that, especially in the Life of Jesus class, I came up to him afterwards and he says, well, let's go to lunch. And I said, Dad, we want to go to prayer. <laughs> we want to fall on our faces. We want to do healing. We want to do whatever. Because when he taught the word, it was alive. And it would just do something to your soul. You want to get saved all over again. <laughs> you know, so it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here because um, I've benefited from um, all of his work. I, I use the God's Empowering Presence book all the time um, because of how many spirit texts there are, how often I end up teaching about that. And most of all, it just keeps you exegetically minded. You know, you can read those small amounts of chapters and it just keeps your brain fresh thinking exegetically. And so I've benefited so much um, as a pastor. And uh, so we're, I'm thrilled, we're thrilled, we're glad to be here. Just thrilled to see the room packed. I wish there could be even more. I know many more would love to be here. So, but anyway, thank you, thank you for doing this. And uh, yay, let's have fun. <laughs> some people out in the hallway, if you could maybe squeeze together a little 
bit just to make space for a few more people, that would be nice. Um, I don't believe that Gordon needs any introduction to this group, but I'll just say a, a, a few words. Uh, as you know, he's Professor Emeritus of New Testament at Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia. Prior to that time, he had taught at Wheaton College, uh, what is now Vanguard University, and Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. I've known Gordon since 1980 at Gordon Conwell when I was a, a student at Gordon Conwell, and, and Gordon was my supervisor during my uh, master's program there. So I've had that, what, 34 years approximately of knowing Gordon. Um, as far as Gordon's academic work, he's known primarily for his work in textual criticism, pneumatology, and then he's also written some significant New Testament commentaries. Probably his, and, and again, it's always hard to measure what are the kind of known books of someone, but I would just say from my personal standpoint, uh, yeah, how to read the Bible for all it's worth. And of course, that's a book that everybody has read, everybody's familiar with. But also, from a Pentecostal perspective, books like God's Empowering Presence. And then just from my interest as a New Testament specialist, I found, I found his commentaries on 1 Corinthians and Philippians especially helpful. Um, for many years, as you know, Gordon served as the general editor of the New International Commentary series of the New Testament. And within that... Uh, you know, within that context, he's, he established himself, obviously, well, that in other ways, he established himself as a very major New Testament scholar, but then also a scholar greatly appreciated by people like myself, sort of younger Pentecostal scholars within the Pentecostal tradition, and especially people like me who are in the New Testament studies. Um, something that will probably cut me out, throughout the years, Gordon has actually maintained ordination with the Assemblies of God, which is kind of an interesting story in and of itself. <laughs> and no doubt, uh, <laughs> and no doubt that, that kind of topic will come up uh, on occasion uh, uh, through the session this morning. What I, um, so what I'd like to do is um, I'll introduce our speakers, and, and roughly we'll go in kind of the order of how long people have known Gordon. Okay, so we'll, uh, so what I'll do is I'll introduce each speaker sort of in the order in which you guys can uh, can speak or can can address the audience, and then I'll just turn it over to uh, you people. And then what we'll do, I've asked each speaker to kind of prepare something about 10, 12 minutes in length, approximately something like that. Is that a Gordon measurement or? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's. Uh, <laughs> Pentecostal time. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so, so each speaker will will share their appreciation for Gordon, and then we'll give Gordon an opportunity to to make a response to that as, as he desires. No? <laughs> and uh, and then what we would like to do is uh, give as much time as possible for just you people to say what you want to say. So uh, so. You know, think as other people are saying things moved on, that will jog your memory as far as some interesting anecdotes you might want to share with respect to uh, Gordon. But let me introduce the speakers briefly. Um, Russ Spittler is Pro Provost Emeritus and Emeritus Professor of New Testament Fuller Theological Seminary, uh, but has also taught at several other universities and uh, seminaries. Again, a very noted Pentecostal scholar, uh, also ordained with the Assemblies of God, is that right? Yes. Last time I checked. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> Who knows if any of us will have credentials with the ATM. <laughs> but anyways, um, and then following him, Murray Dempster uh, will speak. Murray Dempster is Distinguished Professor of Social Ethics at Southeastern University in Lakeland, Florida. Uh, prior to that, he taught many years at... Um, Southern California College, or now Vanguard University, where he also served as provost and president. Um, next, we will hear from Sven Zoderland, who was a longtime colleague of Gordon's at uh, Regent College. Sven is uh, Emeritus Professor of Biblical Studies, and he taught at Regent for about 28 years. Um, Unfortunately, I also invited Andrew Lincoln, but Andrew, you know, he's in, in uh, Cheltenham, England. He was unable to attend the conference, but he did send uh, his appreciation. Chris Thomas of um, the Pentecostal Theological Seminary will read Andrew's uh, 
words. And Andrew and Gordon uh, served together at Gordon Conwell back in the 70s, right? Mm -hmm. For the late, mid to late 70s. Um, we also have Rick Watts, um, who is, again, one of the more recent colleagues of Gordon at uh, Regent College. Rick is a professor of New Testament at Regent and previously taught at institutions in the United States, England, Australia, quite international focus there with uh, Rick. And then we have Marion Mae Thompson, who is the George Eldon Ladd Professor of New Testament at Fuller Theological Seminary, an ordained minister with the Presbyterian Church USA, so your credentials are will be intact at the end of the session. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I also invited Joel Green, but Joel uh, sends his regrets because he, uh, Part of the problem when you're trying to set up these sessions at SBL, you don't know at the time you put in a requested time what that's going to rub up against. And so Joel, unfortunately, uh, was faced with um, a conflict. And then uh, Ron Herms, uh, who is a, a former colleague of mine at Northwest University, but uh, more recently is Dean of the School of Humanities, Religion, and Social Sciences at Fresno Pacific University. and um, had, uh, has known Gordon for quite a while, but particularly while Ron was a student at Regent uh, College. Okay, so, what's that? Sven Sorin. I did mention Sven, yeah. And so, um, wake up, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here crying, I'm sorry. <laughs> So, um, I, and it's not, if, it, I can prompt you, but if you don't remember the sequence, and it's not so the sequence is all that important, but uh, in fact, we have sort of an abstract oh, destruction of, of, what's that? The sequence is important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, the subsequence is important. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, I'll um, turn over to Russ. Well, thank you. And, and what you can do, if, if you're more comfortable speaking from where you are, you can do that, or you can use the podium. Yeah, yeah maybe use the podium. <laughs> Those at the back have a better chance to see you. Thank you, and good morning to uh, everybody. January 1967, how many years ago? 40 plus, a little more. Uh, I came uh, as an ABD, all the dissertation from Harvard to SCC, Southern California College, and located an office uh, very close next to my friend Gordon Fee. And we were together, I think, uh, for only that semester. It's uh, interesting for me to reflect like this. Uh, I was at Wheaton before he was, but as a student, he then came as a faculty member. I was probably at Gordon Divinity School, as it was known then, before him, but again as a student. Uh, he had been in the Pacific Northwest uh, as uh, I got there eventually and occasionally, and the same with uh, Regent. So what I'm saying is that our lives touched for a, a short period of time, and the rest of my encounters and experience of Gordon have been, so to speak, from afar. And like you, I have uh, made a use of the commentaries he has written and the literature he has produced, and those have meant uh, a great deal to me. I, uh, it's, it's, uh, I always caution myself about valuations, but it would be hard for me to name a scholar who has achieved and influenced and impacted the academic world to the extent that Gordon Fee has. I, I, I would be hard put to uh, do anything like that. But uh, I uh, very much have uh, appreciated the time uh, of knowing Gordon, our families, uh, children were close in their younger days, basketball games at uh, SCC and the like. I'll give you a little piece of inside history. Uh, anybody who knows Gordon knows that he doesn't uh, hesitate to speak his mind. <laughs> and in certain denominations, including ours, uh, that's uh, particularly uh, the case. And this is a tradition. Our tradition is uh, uh, not exactly compatible to the enterprise of higher education. After all, the scriptures say you have the Holy Spirit who don't need a teacher. Right. <laughs> I can tell you from my own biography, I was once riding with a car full of pastors to the camp meeting in Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania, and uh, Ralph Riggs 
uh, is the name of a former Secretary of Education who became the General Superintendent, which is the title, rather antiquated, that we give to the Chief Executive Officer in the Assemblies of God. And uh, commenting on that election, one of the pastors said, any denomination that would ever elect its Secretary of Education as the Chief Person of the denomination is certainly sliding downhill. <laughs> 50 or 60 years later, I can't count, but a few years ago I had opportunity, thanks to Mel Robeck, to meet uh, the then Pope, Benedict, and came away realizing with uh, two strong impressions. What was those screaming crimson shoes he was wearing? <laughs> and the second was that here was a denomination which put a lifelong theologian in as a head of its uh, denomination. It certainly would never happen, at least in our lifetimes, in the Assemblies of God. <laughs> because of Gordon's frankness, uh, and because of the uh, proverb, uh, prop is not without honor except in his own country. Uh, his uh, frankness and his uh, bold and, and energetic statements of the intent of scripture, which were, as you heard uh, and will hear, thoroughly life-changing for many people. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, some folk in our church, in the sponsoring denomination, became very uncomfortable with Gordon and, and, and made it such uh, an environment that he was led to accept uh, opportunities elsewhere and the rest is history people could say and I can tell you and be careful how you quote me <laughs> that uh, the district superintendent who was ex officio chair of the board at that time a few years later said to me in confidence that that was the worst mistake he ever made letting Gordon Fee leave Southern California College and it was a loss uh, but it was a gain for the evangelical world and certainly for the uh, movement at large so uh, I have uh, greatest uh, warm feelings for Gordon our wives uh, were close in earlier days and uh, as I mentioned the children uh, to some extent and uh, Gordon has, uh, has uh, exemplified for me what I have come to regard as essential in one's relationship to a church. Uh, as you can well imagine, um, people like, I'd like to say, like Gordon and, and I am uh, as well, are tempted to think about going to other churches, um, other denominations. And I, uh, I, I thought about that a lot, as others have, <coughs> and I have decided uh, if I go to the Presbyterians, I'm going to have to worry about things over there that I don't have to worry about here, <laughs> and I know this tradition a little better, and all of that has, has uh, generated within me uh, uh, an advocacy of what I call critical loyalty, mm -hmm. and that the proper, the proper relationship toward any denomination, any social group, is that of critical loyalty. And I find that uh, exemplified in Paul. Uh, after all, I, I always amuse how many times he says, circumcision is nothing. And I realize, here's a rabbi, rabbi who has held how many foreskins in his hand? <laughs> and he says, it's nothing, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, or, or, or Jesus in his attitude. Uh, he can throw over the tables in the temple, but he can also heal somebody and then say, then say, go, show thyself to the priest, follow the law, follow the rules. So a critical loyalty seems to me to be uh, ideal. And I have to say to my dear friend and colleague, Gordon Fee, that you, Gordon, have exemplified, you have personified for me the posture of critical loyalty. I checked before I came here, he is indeed still an ordained minister. <laughs> I say a salute to, and he and I will understand this, and some of you will, historical way that we would greet each other, Brother Fee, a salute, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Russ. Good afternoon. <laughs> Morning, sorry. I brought some archival material here as proof of what I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, 
three areas. My tribute to Gordon ranges from my student days. Uh, Gordon the academic. And then I worked together on Agora where I meshed with Gordon's prophetic spirit. I want to say that Agora, everybody talks about him losing his papers. I did. <laughs> <laughs> and so did uh, one other person as a consequence of that. And we're going to talk just a little bit about that. Because I got my papers back. <laughs> it was uh, not just that prophetic spirit that marked Gordon, but also his commitment to the church and its mission. Yeah. And I, I just want to emphasize that as the significant aspect from me as Gordon's student. Well, enough has been said about his really classroom decorum. Uh, his lectures were filled with sturdy content. As an undergraduate in Bible, uh, Biblical Studies major, uh, we worked through William Barclay's The Synoptic Gospels. This is where Gordon got in trouble. <laughs> Gospel para uh, Parallels was used for text criticism form criticism, reduction, redaction criticism, and we learned about the historical critical method and exegesis. And if you knew Gordon in those classrooms back in 1967, it was an absolute fantastic time of growth for the students who were in that class. This was viewed as German higher criticism. And uh, if you knew Gordon, he loved teaching about the author's intent. And what impressed me about Gordon was that Gordon had a passion to touch the heart and not just the head of his students. There were times where you feel like if he would have given an, given an altar call, we'd have all been to the front of the room. I never... Um, attended his lectures where I did not have a sense of his piety. And when I say a sense of his, his piety, as there, there was this reality in the classroom for all of us students, that here is someone who is giving us a lecture, here is someone who is, is discussing with us the significance of those synoptic gospels and Pauline Christology. And at the time, there was this sense that, that Gordon was doing this for his love of God. Mm -hmm. He was trying to get us to feel what he was feeling mm -hmm. what, from what he was saying. Mm -hmm. That is, building this relationship with God. It was absolutely fantastic. I took not only synoptic gospels, but I, I took uh, Pauline literature from him. I remember this time where I challenged Gordon because uh, he said that in forensic justification that a person was declared saved but was still a sinner. So he was a Christian and he wasn't a Christian. This was confusing to me. <laughs> and so I raised my hand and I said, uh, I don't understand how you can be a Christian and not a Christian or a sinner and saved. There was no hesitation. It's written in this book. I pulled it out of my suitcase, even though it was for synoptic gospels, <laughs> I carried it with me everywhere. <laughs> Here's what he said. I am a Christian, and by the grace of God, I'm becoming who I am. Mm -hmm. Fee. 
<laughs> you are immortalized. In the front. <laughs> but there, there's Gordon's Gordon's classroom was just a place where we learned to love God, where we learned to be authentic ministers, it was incredible. But Gordon had a prophetic spirit that was just really marvelous. You could feel it in the passion that he had when he taught. And uh, we put together uh, this book, uh, these, uh, this article here called Agora. You'll notice this is where we got in trouble. We put a big AG on the front of it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a magazine of opinion within the Assemblies of God, which uh, one of the realities of getting back in the faith was to say it'll be a magazine of opinion within Pentecostalism. <laughs> but these were the planks of the agenda, promoting an intellectual tradition articulating a prophetic word, developing charismatic models of discipleship, building bridges of fellowship. And there in the contributing editors was Gordon Fee, Gordon Conwell State University. By the way, also in here is George O. Wood, Newport Mesa Christian, South Coast, and, and now he is the first general superintendent. And no doubt, has repented over this. <laughs> <laughs> but you see Russell Spittler, who did Agorafiti. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> that was a winner in Springfield. Uh, and then there was Robert Cooley and a whole variety of academics. Uh, in there, this is the kind of situation with this Agora thing. Um, one of the areas where you really get the tone of, of his work, some reflections on a current disease. <laughs> American Christianity is rapidly being infected by the insidious disease, the so-called wealth and health gospel. Although it has very little of the character of gospel in it, in its more brazen forms, Brother Al, Reverend Ike, it simply says, serve God, get rich, and be healthy. And its more respectable but pernicious forms, it builds $15 million crystal cathedrals to the glory of affluent suburban Christianity. Is this Amos? Is this Isaiah <laughs> Jerusalem? Is this Micah? No, it's Gordon. <laughs> The message goes like this. It's in the Bible. God says it. So think God's thoughts, claim it, and it's yours. What a critique that was. But he wasn't done. He was going to go on the health side of it, too. But I think my the time that I had the most sense of Gordon's prophetic, uh, prophetic spirit, uh, spirit was uh, the fact that we were going to an annual SPS meeting in Springfield, Missouri. And it was, uh, it was, uh, had, it had the opening worship, which was characteristic at that time, where you open up the time with worship. And well, Gordon and I got there earlier, and we walked through the doors of the foyer into the sanctuary. And um, Central. Uh, Assemblies of God had just gone through a major, major repair. It was absolutely fantastic. I mean, the beautiful woods, there was this velvet crimson curtain that went right down after the pulpit and after the choir. And you looked at this, and I heard Gordon go, <clears throat> <laughs> And I, I know exactly what he said. Oh my God. <laughs> we were once pilgrims passing through this world, but we have become the landed aristocracy. That was the spirit. He was a churchman, really, really committed to the mission of the church. 
one of the times that we work together on this seventh annual uh, Pentecostal fellowship at Regent. It was my greatest joy to become the person who did that and actually gave the seventh lecture with my professor in front of me, hoping I was making him proud. It didn't quite work out that way. <laughs> <laughs> but I did enjoy the critique. <laughs> uh, let me just say this uh, on that. Uh, and then I'll end with a coda. But uh, this book, Called and Empowered Global Mission and Pentecostal Perspective, we actually got uh, Gordon to write the opening head chapter, The Kingdom of God and the Church's Global Mission. And if, if you see this book, I was reading it and I was reminded of going back into that classroom and hearing all that fantastic material about the synoptic. But here was using those synoptics to talk about the church's global mission. And it was a fantastic, fantastic chapter in which it demonstrated that. Uh, my, my coda is this. My tribute to you, Gordon, is that you changed my life. You changed my life. That's what I, Jesus said. <laughs> to Southern California College from a Bible Institute, a three-year Bible Institute in Edmonton, Alberta. And I was not prepared for ministry. And I went into ministry in Edmonton, the capital city that had provincial universities. I was now in my first year as a youth pastor, and the student made an appointment and came in and said to me, I'm losing my faith. And how do, how do you deal with cultural relativism? And I drew a blank. I didn't know what cultural relativism was. I actually didn't know what it was, and I said to myself, I am not prepared for this job. And one of the best things that ever happened was an invitation to go down to Long Beach, California and become an associate pastor. And I was 20 minutes down from Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine going from a Bible college into critical thinking? But I became wired for sound, Miss Gordon B. <laughs> really, really, really. Gordon, you changed my life as a result. And not only that, there were the Twin Towers there that were wrestling Gordon. The Twin Towers. And it was this Twin Tower that got me back into <coughs> academics after I said to myself, I need to get a quality education if I'm going to be a good pastor. But I ended up in the academy. Mm -hmm. and what was significant, Gordon, is I said to myself, I need to go to the University of Southern California, the Graduate School of Religion, so I could be like Gordon. Mm -hmm. <laughs>